This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, or NPPV, can be used to manage both acute and chronic respiratory failure. In certain patient populations, NPPV offers the benefits of mechanical ventilation without the risks associated with intubation. All healthcare providers prescribing this therapy must be familiar with patient selection criteria, available equipment, and appropriate ventilator settings. This video will review these issues with a focus on acute respiratory failure. In common use and in this video, the term NPPV refers to bilevel positive airway pressure, or BPAP the term that we will use from this point forward. In BPAP, the ventilator cycles between two pressures, delivering an expiratory positive airway pressure, or EPAP, during expiration, and a higher inspiratory positive airway pressure, or IPAP, during inspiration. The difference between EPAP and IPAP provides pressure support to the patient, thereby increasing tidal volume and directly supporting ventilation. This graph shows airway pressures in a patient receiving BPAP. The tidal volume correlates with the difference between the expiratory and inspiratory pressures. Another common non-invasive mode is continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP. CPAP is a spontaneous breathing mode that is distinct from BPAP. In CPAP, the ventilator delivers one pre-specified positive pressure throughout the respiratory cycle. It does not deliver additional inspiratory pressure and therefore does not directly support ventilation. This graph shows airway pressure in a patient receiving CPAP. The pressure falls during inspiration as the patient takes spontaneous, unsupported breaths and returns to the CPAP value during expiration. Many ventilators can also briefly reduce airway pressure during expiration to increase patient comfort. Consider the use of BPAP when a patient has evidence of respiratory failure. Signs include dyspnea, tachypnea, or use of the accessory muscles of respiration. Gas exchange abnormalities include an arterial pH of less than 7.35, a partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide, or PaCO2, of more than 45 millimeters of mercury, and a ratio of the partial pressure of arterial oxygen, or PaO2, to the fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2, of less than 200. There is strong evidence that BPAP improves outcomes in hypercapnic respiratory failure secondary to acute exacerbations of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and that both BPAP and CPAP improve outcomes in cardiogenic pulmonary edema in the absence of shock or ischemia. There is some evidence that BPAP may be used to treat acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in patients with immune compromise and to help patients with COPD make the transition from invasive mechanical ventilation to spontaneous breathing. An experienced practitioner should determine appropriateness on a case-by-case -case basis. There is insufficient evidence to recommend BPAP for the treatment of pneumonia, asthma, and the acute respiratory distress syndrome. The only absolute contraindications to BPAP and CPAP are cardiac arrest and respiratory arrest. Relative contraindications include discomfort from the mask that cannot be resolved with adjustments, a high risk of aspiration because of impaired mental status, except when the impairment is due to hypercapnia, a large volume of secretions, recurrent vomiting, and recent upper airway or gastrointestinal surgery. The defining feature of BPAP and CPAP is the interface between the patient and ventilator that provides non-invasive airway access. In most cases, this interface is a mask. Many types of masks are available, but in urgent care situations, the oronasal mask is most common. This mask has a silicone cushion that forms a seal around the nose and mouth. If applied too tightly, however, this mask can be uncomfortable and abrade the skin on the bridge of the nose. Alternatives include total face masks, nasal masks, and nasal pillows. The total face mask encompasses the entire face, including the eyes. It does not abrade the nose, but some patients may find it claustrophobic. The nasal mask or nasal pillows generally cause less claustrophobia, but the mouth must remain closed to prevent air leak. Non-invasive ventilators for inpatients typically have a variety of modes, settings, and alarms. 
On this standard ventilator, the physician can toggle between ventilation settings, alarm settings, and ventilation modes by pressing the buttons at the bottom of the screen. This standard ventilator display has two main panels. A top panel conveys real-time information about the patient's breathing in both numeric and graphic formats, while a bottom panel displays the active settings. The data in the top panel include the phase of the respiratory cycle, respiratory rate, tidal volume, minute ventilation, peak inspiratory pressure, and volume of air leak. The graphs indicate airway pressure, airflow, and tidal volume over time. The available settings depend on the mode. In CPAP mode, the basic settings include CPAP itself as well as FiO2. In BPAP mode, the basic settings include IPAP, BPAP, and FiO2. BPAP is most often delivered in the combination spontaneous and timed, or ST, mode, in which the settings also include the minimum respiratory rate and the inspiratory time, or I time. If the patient's respiratory rate is slower than the minimum rate, the ventilator triggers the additional breaths at regular intervals, delivering IPAP for the duration of the I time. If the patient's respiratory rate is faster than the minimum rate, the patient triggers all breaths and the ventilator delivers IPAP whenever spontaneous inspiration is detected. When a patient is in respiratory distress, provide initial support and call for the help of a trained respiratory therapist who can set up the ventilator and troubleshoot any technical problems. If time permits, obtain a baseline measurement of arterial blood gases. Describe the essential features of BPAP to the patient. Doing so usually helps decrease anxiety and may improve tolerance of the treatment. To prepare the ventilator, first select the mode. Patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure due to COPD should receive BPAP. Patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema without shock or ischemia may receive either CPAP or BPAP since both provide positive end expiratory pressure, which is beneficial in ventricular dysfunction. If the patient has hypercapnia, however, BPAP is more appropriate. Next, enter the initial settings. Start with low pressures and adjust upward as needed. If BPAP is being used, set the initial inspiratory and expiratory pressures to 10 and 5 centimeters of water, respectively. Accept the settings to activate the mode. Next, apply the mask to the patient. Be sure the straps are tight enough to secure the mask without causing unnecessary discomfort. You should be able to place two fingers easily between the straps and the patient's head. The mask should fit comfortably over the nose and mouth without extending beyond the chin. Another example of the correct fit is shown here. If the patient is uncomfortable or if a large air leak is noted, reposition the mask or change it to a different size or type. Adjust the alarms in accordance with the clinical scenario and ventilator settings. Assess the patient whenever an alarm occurs. In this case, the patient's tidal volume is greater than the high tidal volume alarm threshold. If this tidal volume is acceptable, however, the alarm threshold can be adjusted. Monitor the patient's symptoms and vital signs closely and adjust the FiO2 to achieve the desired oxygen saturation. Measure another arterial blood gas after 30 minutes to determine whether further changes to the ventilator settings are required. If there is persistent hypercapnia, increase the minute ventilation by changing either the tidal volume or the respiratory rate. Recall that the tidal volume will increase as the difference between the IPAP and EPAP increases. Note that increasing the minimum respiratory rate will affect ventilation only if the patient's spontaneous breathing rate is slower than this rate. If there is persistent hypoxemia, increase either the fraction of inspired oxygen or the EPAP. Note that if the EPAP is increased, the IPAP should be increased proportionally so that the amount of pressure support does not change. If the patient has persistent respiratory distress despite adjustments to the ventilator or mask, or if a contraindication to BPAP develops, such as vomiting, perform endotracheal intubation immediately. In contrast, if respiratory failure is reversed with BPAP, the level of ventilatory support can be reduced until the patient is ready to attempt spontaneous breathing again. BPAP can help stabilize patients with acute respiratory failure and prevent the need for intubation. The patients most likely to benefit include those with acute hypercapnic respiratory failure caused by a COPD exacerbation and those with cardiogenic pulmonary edema in the absence of shock or ischemia.